Chief Shipman Carriazzo. He's been extremely kind to take us around the Naval Academy. It's um, usually open to uh, for tours. Right now it's closed because of uh, COVID-19. Um, so we've done a little bit of an outside walking tour and we got a, a lot of, uh, of history and stuff. But we want to take just a moment. Um, I want to take some time uh, every so often through our episodes to introduce somebody uh, that's doing something really amazing with their life to uh, pass on some knowledge, knowledge and experience and hopefully uh, inspire others. Um, and so I asked Mitch uh, Carriazzo if he would mind if we just talk about quickly, if you were to talk to some teenagers or people that are in high school, if you're starting to look at heading out into the big world, uh, possibly to college or not to college, or how would you find your way as you, as you start to leave um, high school? <laughs> yeah, it's the Harvard Queen going on your way. Um, yeah, so high school, I mean, coming to the Naval Academy was last minute decision in, in reality. It was a couple months right before summer seminar, our, our summer program that opens up for, for high school students to, to come visit. Right before the due date um, actually got, got to me. So I learned from the, about the Academy three days before that due date. I took a chance um, and, and I thought it was something I wanted to do. I, I love the water, I've always been in the water. And um, my parents being immigrants and, and coming to the United States and being given an opportunity, I thought it was the best, best way to give back and, uh, and, and that service aspect that, that the military has. So uh, I took a chance and, um, and I said, sign me up and uh, I love this place. And uh, it's been three years now, I'm coming up on my graduation in May and uh, coming up on my commission hopefully uh, where, where I'll earn my bars and, and go out into the fleet and, and even even bigger world but you know follow your dreams yeah I, I, I took a chance take a risk sometimes it's, it's it's really worth it and everything will be okay uh, you know just just take a little bit of a risk do something crazy every once in a while and, and follow your heart, follow your dreams, definitely. But we'd love to have you on board for a passage and let's go somewhere, let's go sailing and yeah, let's see you at the helm on our boat. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. We're gonna go upstairs in just a second because we want to show you the solar uh, panels upstairs. This is the obviously the bottom of it. Um, without the solar um, array that we've had added on, this would be the, the end or the back of the cockpit roof. By adding this solar arch, you can see these are the solar panels that go all the way out. So in some ways, uh, it certainly extends the rooftop area, gives us more shade and protection from the weather elements. It gives the dinghy a little more protection from those weather elements. The other bonus was that by adding, we have four panels um, up on top, which required a uh, custom stainless steel rack, which are these handles here. Now the great bonus of these, these handles, there's one on each transom, is that it makes it a lot easier to get out of the water. Even when you pull up with the dinghy, it's a nice handhold to get a hold of and, and get out of the boat. Um, obviously this side, we have a swimming ladder so you can climb out. But on the other side, when you pull up with the, uh, with the dinghy, it's just something nice to, to be able to get a hold of. So let's go upstairs. We'll take a look at the panels that we have up there and explain how the system works. All right. Okay, so let's talk about uh, solar on Aliluki. So we installed, well, actually we installed, Joe's Cameron's installed four uh, solar panels. We selected the uh, LG panels. They're 365 watts each. And this system puts out roughly just short of 1,500 watts. Oh. Sorry, if I'm talking too loud, now the microphone's you too close. Swallow them. Oh. <laughs> All right, so let me start over. <clears throat> Put that in a blooper reel. Okay. So on solar, we um, opted for a solar arch. Again, I would mentioned downstairs, uh, this is a custom-made solar um, panel uh, arch uh, that the solar panels are bolted into. I can't even talk. I'm talking in circles. <laughs> <laughs> we have four solar panels there, mounted to this custom solar arch, the stainless steel arch. So the, the 
really, really great thing is, other than the fact that it makes free electricity, is that because this is positioned behind the boat, none of the, the mast, sails, or running rigging um, interfere uh, with the sun. Now, uh, obviously, it depends on where we are, what time of the day it is, uh, and which way we're sailing. But for the most part, um, these... Actually, we've been here for three days now, and we've turned on the generator um, once. Yeah, um, we had mentioned that as you outfit your boat, uh, you know, add the things that you need right away. For us, one of the th key things was adding the solar. Now, the solar generates just short of 1,500 watts of power, but we, we kept uh, in, in place the, um, the inverter that came from the factory. Now, when we get lithium batteries, or if we upgrade to the lithium batteries, which are far more usable, the, 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 the big difference between these batteries is that the AGMs you do not want to take below, I think it's 55 or maybe 50%, um, because beyond that, you're, you're essentially damaging or shortening the life of the battery. The lithium batteries can go down to, I don't know, 10 percent or something. I mean, it's usable. The, the usable consumption band is far greater than what is on the AGMs. It just makes sense. Actually, financially, it, it made sense. Yes, it costs money to put this in, but every day it gives us free electricity. And so here we're able to stay out on Anchorage for very long periods of time and and have electricity without using any fuel uh, with the uh, with the generator. So we love this from the, the standpoint of how it, it gives us more comfort. Um, with regards to uh, electrical and it gives us a little more shade gives the dinghy and everything a little more uh, protection down there so i think solar is a a huge bonus um, to living aboard your boat and definitely worth the investment all right so in the uh in the world of factory options this is a big one. Um, this is our Northern Lights 9 kilowatt generator. It is a basically your, your onboard power plant. Um, we opted again for this because we are living aboard, doing extended cruising. Uh, we will be doing you know offshore passages. So this works in conjunction with or, or uh, augments our solar system. We try to use only the solar as much as possible, but there are times when you have cloudy days or you just need more power. Um, and so when you turn this uh, generator on, you could run everything inside. You can run, if you have a microwave, or we, we don't use a microwave, but we have the, uh, the, the uh, little, uh, what do they call them, like a countertop oven. oven. Um, we use that, or your little um, hot water kettles, electric hot water kettles, or the washer and dryer, and the air conditioners, and all those big electrical consuming items, you can run with this. Now, obviously, so a good example is we're going to be cruising in warmer areas, the, the tropics, the, the Caribbean. There are going to be some pretty uh, hot and humid nights. And uh, so you want to be able to run the air conditioner all throughout the night. This is why you would, you would run your generator for that. Now, obviously, this is a big and expensive option but if it's again if your plans are to use the boat as a live aboard and and cruise it's not an absolute necessity it's not an emergency thing but this boils down to true comfort of living on board so you know instead of sleeping in a pool of sweat or having fans blow hot air on you or you want to be able to to cook or you want to you know heat up water for the showers uh, and things of that nature you you would need something like this so uh, it's very fuel efficient. I believe uh, as this is running, it runs um, about or it uses, consumes about three quarters of a gallon per hour. So that's not really bad at all, given all the the, uh, the luxuries or comforts that it, it affords you uh, inside the boat. So we love the thing, super low maintenance. Um, and again, if you were to live aboard or cruise, um, circumnavigate things of that nature, we would definitely recommend opting for, for one of these. So this is our Viking uh, life raft. Um, it's an eight person life raft. This is what was living downstairs in that large um, uh, storage locker down in the aft cockpit. We moved it from there and brought it up here. So the beauty of this is that it's right behind the helm. So if uh, the poop hits the fan and we have some serious problems going on and we need to deploy this, all you have to do is pull this black strap and push this thing right into the water. It's tethered. You see this red, uh, this line is tethered to the boat so that this is what stays attached to the boat. Um, and it's a long line that will go out. So the, uh, the reason they have this 
is that uh, let's just say it's just a really bad day and um, the boat we've called Mayday and we just simply need, need to be saved. This is tethered to the boat because catamarans in general will not sink for a very long time. So even if this vessel was completely inverted, um, the hulls would be floating, um, I'm told, for many, many days. And so you want to stay near um, the largest thing that's floating uh, for the, the sake of being rescued. So we could stay in this life raft. It has a whole canopy and all kinds of other things inside for, um, for life-saving measures. Um, but we would stay tethered to the boat. Now, you can always disconnect the tether if something happened, but um, it keeps you next to your vessel so that it's easier for the Coast Guard to find you. But um, we find this to be a much better place um, to put it. The only other place we would put it, and on the Leopard 45, it's, it's really hard, is that you could build an additional stainless steel sleeve down at the transom and deploy it from there but we don't really have the room. The larger the Leopard 50 and the bigger boats do. Um, so most Leopard 45 owners, and I believe Leopard 40 owners, put it up here. When it comes to sails and uh, rigging, there are um, a variety of options. Um, from the factory, obviously, you, you get a, the mainsail and a headsail. On the mainsail, uh, there are two. You have the traditional sail that has the pointy top to it. We opted for uh, the uh, square top main. Um, and so um, I we just think it, it looks cooler. I think it gives us a little more uh, performance uh, with sail, sail area. Um, so we opted for the square top main. Uh, you have the Genoa here, which is a, a slightly larger um, head sail. And then anything beyond that is going to be an option. So you would option uh, to add what's called, uh, named uh, Code Zero or the Code D. Uh, when you opt for one of those, they install this thing, this pole right here, which is called a bowsprit. And then the cables and the rest of this is all the rigging in support of that. Um, this uh, line right here, this yellow one that I'm holding, um, actually connects to the furling drum for the Code Zero. Then that is actually uh, pulled out to the very front of that uh, bowsprit. And then you use the halyard for the Code Zero to hoist. You know, the, the, uh, the Code Zero is furled like this. So it's, it's just like the jib where it's all wrapped and rolled up. So then it'll get rolled, uh, or sorry, it'll get hoisted on the outside here all the way to the top of the main. And then now we have two head sails. So as we're sailing, if we're in conditions where the wind is at nine, 10, 11 knots, not quite enough wind to keep this heavier sail um, filled, then you would furl this thing up, put it away, and you bring out the, the code zero. And it just gives you a little more versatility, a greater range of reaching uh, and trying to grab the wind at uh, a variety of different wind angles. Um, and we actually, we love it. Uh, I know it's, it takes a little bit getting used to as far as how to rig it and, um, and when you're, gonna, you're going to tack, it's a little bit different than doing it from the helm because you have to do the tacking from up here as far as switching from port to starboard tack. But it's a fantastic sail, and the best part, obviously, that it allows you to sail in lighter wind conditions. So, again, it's not one of these things that uh, it's not a must-have, but if you're going to be living aboard and doing an extensive amount of extended cruising and sailing, you do want to have the ability to sail as much as possible. It's way more fuel efficient than running your engines, um, and uh, I, I, you know it's. Obviously, there's a cost uh, to have, th have it installed, but it's uh, a very, very usable uh, and comfortable sail to have out. Okay, so real quickly, we'll go through the, the uh, lines here. Um, all the sheets are laid out really, really nice on Leopard 45. I love this because you can truly uh, run this boat as one person. These labels Maki did put on here, um, you are not going to miss those. Uh, but they are, it's super easy to read. So uh, they're broken down by the furler. This is what rolls up the jib or the head sail. You've got reefing lines, reef one and reef two. Um, so these are to shrink or, or minimize the size of the mainsail. You want to do that when you have heavy winds, so you're not exposed. Your sail's not exposed to uh, so much wind, and, and uh, it's just simply safer. Code zero. This one is if you have an additional headsail, uh, and we'll go over that uh, in just a little bit here. There is the bowsprit up front, which allows us to run a second 
head sail. You would do that because uh, if you are in much lighter winds, you need a different sail that can reach uh, further and is a little more versatile and lighter material so you can actually uh, hoist it in, in lighter winds. Uh, the Genoa uh, on both Genoa 1 and on the other side here is Genoa 2, depending on which, whether you're on a port or a starboard tack, this is simply the uh, running sheets for the main um, head sail, so that it's for the, uh, for the Genoa. If you did not have a bowsprit, you would not have this. This would probably be just these two. So we have the code zero here because this, this, um, this sheet is actually, this is the halyard for the code zero. So when we're ready to hoist it, uh, this is what you would use to pull that sail all the way to the top. Um, and then to open it, you would end up running two separate um, sheets for that, for that sail specifically. <laughs> This is where Andy goes when he's in trouble. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this is either Ooh. called the engine bay or the dog house. I like that one. idea. <laughs> I never thought of this, but I will consider. All right, so real quickly, because it's warm down here. So um, there's not much to show uh, down here. I mean, these are the standard uh, 45 horsepower Yanmars uh, that come with the Leopard 45. Um, I don't know if you can see this. The one thing we did add um, was Raycor filter. So this is the filter that Yanmar um, has made it's a, it's a fuel filter for that comes standard with the Anmar engine. We added these ray cores, so that kind of um, this is the, your first defense really on um, on fuel filtration. It then goes into this one, and to be honest, we have triple. I think this is an, uh, the third one here. So we have three fuel filters on each engine. Um, so I, I think that's plenty. <laughs> one other thing that we had uh, just catamarans do were these Glaston panels. So the Glaston panel is this, this kind of curb, curb thing you see sitting here. This was not here. When the boat comes from the factory, this is one smooth area all the way back under the uh, transom steps. This is where we keep all our extra oil, fuel filters, all of this stuff. On the port side, we actually have empty, and we can go over there real quick if you want to film it. The purpose of this space may change, but for us right now, as we are on uh, longer passages where we end up with um, several bags of trash, um, this is where we actually put them. So we double bag the plastic so we don't have any le leaking issues. And then the plastic bags of trash come down here. And then when we pull into port, we pull into a marina, then we dispose of all, all the trash properly. Yeah. 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 Okay, so this is the uh, this is the anchor department. <laughs> and let's talk about what we've got going on up here. So we uh, the from the factory, you get this little controller. Uh, this is what's going to control the, uh, the windlass to bring the anchor up and down. Um, we opted for a backup to this as far as uh, bringing, this is bringing the anchor up, right, Maki? This, uh, this switch. I don't know. I've never used it. The <laughs> One? This one, yeah. The, the swivel that comes from the factory um, is fine, but uh, we wanted to put something that was heavier duty, a little more beefy because we use the anchor so much. So I think what came from the factory was a Delta anchor. We changed it out to a Rokna anchor, which we have loved. That thing is amazing. We uh, opted for uh, more chain. So instead of the 164, we opted for, I believe it's just short of 300 feet in chain. Uh, what else am I missing? Oh, we opted for, if you want to look over here, this is a secondary switch. So if something happens with that remote, handheld remote, this is a foot switch for the anchor system. If you look here, uh, this is a quick connect. So you flip this up. You stick the connection in and you turn it, and this allows you to opt for either seawater or fresh water. Um, what we tend to do is use the, the salt water side of it, so we rinse off the, uh, the anchor and all the chain as it's coming up. And then once it's in the locker and everything's up here, we switch over to fresh water and give a quick rinse off of fresh water. And the pile of chain that's down in the chain locker, we also flush that quickly with fresh water. Um, but it's nice. It's nice to be able to just you know, keep it clean. Um, here in the Chesapeake, there is an absolute ton of mud that comes up with the chain and anchor, so it's nice to be able to clean it off every time we, we uh, pull anchor. Uh, 
uh, Leopard, uh, as well as uh, the other uh, boat manufacturers, used to put rub rails on. From a cost standpoint, they eliminated it some years ago. So now you have the option to do it aftermarket. We kept talking about, can is this something that we could do without? 3500 bucks is not a small uh, price tag. And uh, in the end, we had decided to go ahead and have it put on. Um, it is definitely worth putting on. I, I, you always think, okay, well, can we do without it? When we pull into a dock or into a marina, would we be able to just use fenders? Maybe we have Oliver Lucas, two or three of us up front, or wherever the, the uh, a fender would be needed, and just fend off from a dock. But you never know exactly what you're up against when you pull into a, you know, each marina. Well, are they floating docks, fixed docks? How are the pylons set? And so in the end, we decided to, to have the rub rails put on. Um, we are very happy that we did. Again, I know it's a $3,500 option, and you might be saying, yeah, I don't know if I want to do that. But as Laurent at Just Catamarans had pointed out, you're never going to get that, um, that fender in the right spot exactly at the right moment. Anyway, we would highly recommend getting the rub rail. It's uh, at $3,500. It's far cheaper than fixing fiberglass or gel coat because it got damaged, cracked, rubbed up against, um, and in the end ends up looking, well, not so good. So there you have it. Something else that we added here in the aft cockpit, um, well, we bought this aftermarket, uh, which is just a magma grill. However, one thing that to make this work, you're going to need the gas line plumbed back here. So that is an option from the factory, which is uh, this black line. So that is actually, if you can see it over here, it's going to come to this side. So you see this, this black line comes down and it's plumbed in right here at the bottom. That goes underneath to the, uh, to the tanks. So this brings, so when you get the boat, if you opt for this, it will come with this black gas line plumbed back here. Then you simply get your grill mounted to the rail and connect it and you're good to go. So super simple way to um, have your grill hooked up. Um, covering things up, getting covers for almost anything you can will certainly extend the life of it. So that's it. Hey Andy, can you show us the gas? Yep. Um, so the LPG tanks, um, I don't know if you want to go back over here. They. So we're in the aft cockpit. This is... Um, the gas locker so these guys are stored back here there's two LPG tanks strapped in one is a, a, a backup to the other one so as this one runs out and you connect then your next opportunity to fill up wherever you would want to fill that up um, this is then connected to the system inside uh, we could show you where the the on and off switch uh, is for that you have to actually turn it on so that the regulator here releases the gas this yellow this yellow one right here is in the off position right now, you would flip this, turn this up to uh, allow gas to flow to your grill back here. Without that turned into the on position, you the grill won't start. You only want that on while you're using the grill. Don't ever leave that on uh, while you're not using the grill. Um, so after we're done grilling, the first thing that we actually do, at the same time that I turn that thing off here, I open this off and, and turn it off right away. Um, it's just so you don't forget. It's so easy to obviously, hey, the burgers or fish or whatever it is is done. You turn off the flame and you forget to turn this off. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's a good habit to get into. But anyway, this is where it's stored. Uh, they're strapped and safe. Mm -hmm. Can you show us oh, what do we have in this one? So on, do you want to call it the port side here? This is another storage locker, pretty much similar to the one where the gas is. Uh, just a viewer warning, this might be messy. No, it's not. <laughs> Okay, so right now, shoes. Shoes, we shoes. have all our shoes stored in here um, and then tucked down below because we don't use it uh, that often at all is extra road for the uh, aft anchor if we ever needed that. But that uh, um, extra road and chain is stored down here. Uh, for, for whoever the mechanic is on the boat. Hmm. Was that he or she? She. Me. Let me toss this over here. This space here. 
is where I keep all my tools, all my extra spare parts, um, everything. So underneath here, wow. I can open this real quick. So you label it all nicely. This is a buffer. Okay, so you see this, this here. This is, uh, it looks like shelving, but this is where the batteries, the house batteries are stored. So if you lift these up, you'd have whatever, we have three or four AGMs uh, down underneath here. Um, I store all my tools, all the, just, it, you know, I don't know, you don't think about this when you're at home, but you know, all your, everything that needs to be charged, whether it's the electric scooter, the iPads, the phones, the flashlights, whatever, there's so many electrical cords. So. Uh, we try to keep things organized. Uh, the system that I've been using so far is that I just get some uh, Ziploc bags and label them and then all of those cords get stored here. Um, I have tons of storage down here. So this is extra foam covering you've got. Oh, the other thing I would, would recommend and maybe somebody has a different system. Um, I, I bought three of these because these are smaller tool bags and I've kind of... Uh, categorize each bag you know whether they're the pliers or you know locking clamps or things of that nature all in one bag screwdrivers and other things that are in these bags so I can take a tool bag or two tool bags to whatever location on the boat and work on it but the main reason really to be honest was that not everything was jumbled up into one one big tool bag making it heavier and messier but it's hard getting it in and out of these smaller spaces mm. if you have to take a tool bag down in the engine bay with you it's a lot harder so this bag is filled with nothing but a variety of, of super glues, Loctite. Um, the blue, the blue uh, thread locker. Uh, if we haven't pointed it out, I'll walk around and show a couple places in the boat. You definitely want to have this on the boat. You would be shocked at how much of the the uh, threaded nuts come vibrate loose and eventually could just fall right off. So I've uh, and this was guidance from people like Captain Richard other Leopard 45 owners. Um, another option that's uh, here at the uh, Portside Transom steps is this uh, wash down little shower. Uh, this thing, and so you can see it, gives you water. The beauty of this is that this gives you hot and cold water. And it's fantastic for, uh, you know, obviously when you've gone swimming, anything that's gone into the salt water, including you, uh, it's great to rinse off, rinse the salt off anything you do from scuba diving to um, snorkeling, all that gear should get rinsed in fresh water. And having hot and cold water back here, uh, it actually feels phenomenal when you get out of the ocean and rinse off with a nice hot shower. So, all right, so something that we had just catamarans add, uh, this isn't necessarily, a, um, I wouldn't say it's a full blown safety thing. Uh, there is a, a great safety somewhat benefit to it. These are um, essentially working lights or lights that light up your transom steps. The beauty of these, these are LEDs. They light up either white or a really cool blue, I guess. Uh, like a, I don't know what you would call the, the blue, but it, we'll film it at night so you guys can see it. Um, the great thing about it is obviously it gives light. Uh, if you're working or you just, something's going on, um, you can light stuff. We, we turn on the blue ones at night when we're even on the boat. It's just, it's nice uh, ambient lighting. You're gonna go on the boat to shore on a dinghy and you're gonna come back uh, after the sun has set, or you're gonna go visit other friends on a, in the anchorage on another boat. You could uh, be coming back in utter darkness, and um, the only thing that's gonna be on would be your anchor light. Now, if you're in an anchorage and there's 20 other boats, all you're gonna see is 20 white lights everywhere, and you're gonna be guessing which boat is yours. So it's fantastic to have these on because it really makes it super easy to find your boat. Um, again, we use them anytime we, we leave the boat and we're going to uh, come back after dark. Or, like I said, we it's something nice we use while we are even here on the boat. It's just nice ambient lighting. Another factory option that we added uh, are these um, shades. What are those? <laughs> they are uh, just window shades, uh, removable window shades. Okay. So they go over on the side windows only. So what they do is they um, diffuse the light, which also reduces the heat. And uh, when it's really hot, you know, during the summer, uh, the, they definitely keep the inside of the saloon cooler, uh, matches with the black windows. So they look a little bit less um, visible. So right. they're 
great option to have.